Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're going to begin an instructional series on the Gambler's Chest expansion for Kingdom Death Monster. Now I just finished up my instructional series for Aeon Trespass Odyssey and the next one that I'm going to be focusing on besides this is Dungeon Universalis. Dungeon Universalis is actually going to be my primary focus, uh, but in between each video of Dungeon Universalis, I'm going to do one of these. And just to give you an idea of how it will be broken up, the instruction book here for, for the Gambler's Chess expansion already has things broken up pretty well. And so I'm going to actually just go through each of these sections. So today we're going to be covering the new core rules. The next video will cover this monsters section. Then we'll cover the Ark Survivors. And then the narrative sculptures, we're not gonna make a video about that, obviously, but we will go into the character cards and everything. And that'll be obviously a pretty quick video. And we probably, actually this one, the character cards, we'll probably, instead of just putting out a quick little five minute video on that, we'll probably uh, combine it maybe with another video. But then we'll have our encounters section and then a patterns video and then the scouts and then the wanderer the wanderers we may maybe we'll combine characters and wanderers together since they're both one pagers so that's how this series is going to get broken up you can see that the individual videos will be uh probably fairly short, probably around 20 minutes or so each. And so that will allow me to get this content out while also handling the Dungeon Universalis videos. So now let's get into the new core rules. Synchronic attacks are powerful actions that simultaneously affect all survivors in a zone. To perform a synchronic attack, the monster controller examines the zone. As you can see, it could show up like this or like this. After determining the zone, you'll note all the survivors that are within it and then you will make a single set of attack rolls. So in this situation, for the 21,000 Newton Byte, you can see that based off of this diagram here, these three survivors are all in the zone. This one is outside of the zone. 21,000 Newton Byte has a speed of two, and assuming that the crocodile does not have any speed modifiers, we will roll two dice and apply these results to all three of these survivors. Individual survivors' evasion, dodge, block, deflect, and gear will apply only to that survivor, as you might expect, when determining hits. In this case, you can see the accuracy was 3+, plus, and assuming there's no further modifiers, then we have two hits here. Now that the hits have been determined, the monster controller will select a hit survivor and resolve the rest of the attack, rolling hit location dice, dealing damage, and triggering the effects before moving to the next hit survivor. So let's say we would resolve this survivor first. You can see there is a before damage trigger, so we would resolve this. If they are terrified or deaf, they cannot avoid this attack. Otherwise, you hear the zealous finger strumming and escape the bite's full power, reduce the damage in this attack profile to one. So as long as this survivor is not terrified or deaf, it doesn't do 21 damage, it does one damage and it does it to his body twice. You would then resolve the same for this survivor and then resolve the same for this survivor, rolling these dice each time for each survivor. Once all hits are resolved, the action ends and the next action on the card would be performed if there were any. Obviously in this case, that's the end of the card. Now, as I showed you earlier, there are two types of synchronic attack cards. Move and synchronic attack target here, and move and attack synchronic attack target with a specific space. So in the case of a synchronic attack such as this one, where it's simply move and synchronic attack target, the monster controller will identify the shortest path to get the target into the attack zone. So in this case, the monster would just move here. If it is not possible and the synchronic attack cannot reach the target, the monster will move as close to the target as possible. If moving in this way results in other survivors ending up in the zone of attack, then the monster will still attack even if the actual target did not make it into the zone. 
With move and synchronic attack specific space, as you can see here, the monster controller must try to move the monster until the target is in the highlighted space. So this is the middle space in the back of the monster. So this monster would move here and then turn around so that the survivor is in that middle rear space. If for any reason the target cannot be in the highlighted space, the monster controller must try to move the monster so the target is at least in the attack zone, so one of the blue spaces. If that's not possible, they will move the monster as close to the target as possible. And again, just as before, if other survivors end up in the attack zone as a result, the monster will attack whether or not the target made it into the zone. Vibration damage is a new damage type and is caused by sound so powerful it's shockwaves, shatter armor, and bone alike. When suffering vibration damage, you will not roll hit location dice. Instead, add all the damage points from successful hits. In this case, we have two successful hits at one damage each, so that is two damage total, and begin resolving the damage one point at a time. You decrease your armor points, you check injury boxes, and you suffer severe injuries at hit locations of your choice until all damage has been dealt. While being able to choose the location where this damage is dealt might seem like a positive thing, and it can be in some ways, keep in mind the damage is resolved one point at a time. This means that a survivor without any armor left may end up suffering multiple severe injuries when resolving vibration damage. Vibration damage also destroys delicate items. After suffering vibration damage, a survivor must archive any gear with the fragile keyword. Also, since no hit location dice are rolled, hits causing vibration damage cannot be dodged. However, they still can be blocked or deflected. Rules that reduce damage from a hit will apply to each hit before the damage is added together. Some attack profiles now have range. Range determines how far a monster's attack can reach. A standard attack profile requires the monster to be adjacent to its target, so you will not deal with ranged attacks unless it specifically states range here. Monsters will always maneuver to keep the survivors at bay while they attack. When a monster performs a move into range and attack target, move the monster towards the target until it is a number of spaces equal to the range away from the target. So here you can see we are already at 6 range. However, if the monster is adjacent or anywhere within that range 6, as you can see for this card, the monster will actually move away in an effort to achieve maximum range. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Another new type of AI card is the Repeat card. Repeat will be performed turn after turn, and often it will power up. After resolving a Repeat card, Place it face up on top of the AI deck. The next time the monster would draw an AI card, it will instead draw this face up repeat card from the top of the deck. While a repeat AI is on top of the AI deck, ignore any effects that would manipulate the AI deck, such as the rawhide headband or the whistling mace. The only way to move the repeat AI card from this loop is to wound the monster. Once the monster is wounded, if this card had accumulated any tokens, remove them and then place it in the wound stack as normal. Unless, of course, the monster has the life trait, in which case you would place it in the discard pile. There is also a new type of reaction. As you can see here, there is a CR here, which stands for compulsive reaction. In this case, a compulsive reaction to a wound. Compulsive reactions cannot be stopped. Effects such as the Qatar specialization or a critical wound that cancel monster reactions do not cancel compulsive reactions. These reactions even occur if the monster is knocked down. However, unless the compulsive reaction itself instructs the monster to stand up, it will stay knocked down even after performing this reaction. When survivors defeat a monster with the indomitable trait, they will gain a single indomitable resource as part of their reward. Draw a single random one from the monster's indomitable resource deck and add it to your take. However, if the monster does not have any indomitable resources or the indomitable trait, then you obviously will not draw an indomitable resource. Indomitable resources often will inspire new patterns. 
If an effect ever instructs a survivor to gain a monster resource of their choice, they cannot gain an indomitable resource. It can only be gained by defeating an indomitable monster. Also, you will note that they do have resource types, in this case, organ. They can be spent as a regular organ or bone or hide, whichever resource type they have, just as any other resource. Survivors can sometimes find themselves whisked off the showdown board. When they are, follow the rules from the effect that remove them. Often this will involve placing a survivor's miniature on the survivor status card. Survivors who are off the showdown board cannot be targeted by the monster or suffer any effects that the monster performs on all survivors. Their status cards or story events may still affect them, however. At the start of their act, a survivor off the showdown board gains movement and activation as normal, but often they won't be able to spend them. If they return to the showdown board before their act ends, they may spend them as normal. Keep an eye out for any card with this symbol as it should be excluded until you are told to use them. The Gambler's Chest also introduces monster nodes. These are an easy way to, in a sort of balanced way, customize your campaigns. A campaign revolves around its central adversaries, a core monster and a finale monster. For the People of the Lantern campaign, which is the one that comes with the base game, the core monster is the Watcher, and the finale monster is the Gold Smoke Knight. When customizing a campaign, you cannot remove the core monster or the finale monster. However, any other quarry or nemesis can be replaced by others from its same node. So for instance, using the information on page 56 of the Gambler's Chest rulebook, maybe I will change the white lion to the crimson crocodile and the screaming antelope which is a node 2 monster to the flower knight and the phoenix which is a node 3 monster to the sunstalker Based on the specifics of these monsters and how their individual rule books describe adding them to a campaign, you may need to then adjust the events that occur within the timeline. And obviously, as you remove certain monsters, certain events will get removed as well. And you just need to make sure you do that appropriately. And then, of course, we can also adjust our nemesis monsters. So here we've got the Butcher level one. So maybe instead, since the Butcher is a node one nemesis, I'll replace the butcher with the manhunter, which is my personal favorite nemesis expansion. And obviously that would mean this butcher would become the manhunter and this butcher would become the manhunter. And then we've got another nemesis encounter here, the Kingsman. So we will, that's a node two. So we will replace the Kingsman, let's say with uh, Atnus. And let's see, we've got the hand here, and the hand is a node 3, and actually there are no other node 3 nemesis, so we probably actually need to leave the hand in there. Uh, maybe replace it with the special nemesis monster, the Lonely Tree, but it is the only node 3 nemesis currently out. As you can see, this goes on to show you that currently there are four core monsters, Watcher for People of the Lantern, Gambler for People of the Dreamkeeper, Dragon King for People of the Stars, Sunstalker for People of the Sun, and there are only two finale monsters currently. This page of the rules also shows you the campaign pillars. These increase the complexity of Kingdom Death Monster as well as the immersion into the world. You have Ark Survivors, Encounters, Scouts, Seed Patterns, Wanderers, and Characters that are all pillars introduced with the gambler's chest. If at any point you use two or more pillars, you are at that point using what's known as advanced kingdom death monster rules. As we continue this instructional series, we will cover all of these pillars and go into detail with them. But just know that the higher the pillar count that you add to your campaign, the more complex it is going to be. The people of the Dreamkeeper campaign that is included with the gambler's chest uses all of these accept characters to begin with, though you can throw characters in as well. And those are the new core rules that you need to know to get started with the content from the Gambler's Chest expansion. 
Be sure to come back as we will continue putting out videos as we dig deeper into this rule book. The people of the Dreamkeeper campaign and the rules in here are just so much fun to incorporate into your Kingdom Death Monster experience. I've had a blast with it so far and I really barely scratched the surface waiting for my game group to really dig deep into this. Uh, shouldn't be too much longer before we finally do. Very, very exciting stuff. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to come back for our Dungeon Universalis instructional series as we begin that. And we might throw another small game in uh, between then and now as well. We'll kind of see how we're doing with that uh, when the time comes. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.